welcome back to Beyond the 90. We've got a very special guest today. We've got John Ledridge from Leicester City. Uh, John, for people that don't know what you do at the club, um, do you want to give a brief outline of what you do? Uh, yeah, so I've um, been at the club coming up to uh, nine years now and uh, my official title is Head of Sports, Surf and Grounds. So pretty much anything you see that isn't a building and is external um, or by the tarmac um, falls under my remit and, and comes uh, sort of my team work on all those areas. So yeah, got a big team now. Uh, we've gone from six when I joined uh, back nine years ago and now we're at 52. So yeah, massive growth, but all needed, all necessary to cover the footprint and the, the developments the club's gone through over the last few years. Wow, that's, that's a massive leap from six to 52 in nine years. Yeah. Uh, obviously, a lot of logistics around that. Uh, one thing I wanted to touch on about the Turf Academy, um, as a Leicester fan, quite proud of it, but it's kind of a new concept to me. Um, is this like the first one in the country or are there quite a few Turf Academies around the Premier League and other grassroots grounds? Yeah, well, it's well, to be honest, it's the first in the world because it came out of my head. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I had the, the idea for the concepts probably back in 2013 when I worked at Coventry City. I'm sorry to say that. It's a bit of a swear word, isn't it? Um, <laughs> but I worked at Coventry City and uh, as some of the football fans may know that they they left the Rico Arena and went to play at Northampton and unfortunately left me behind at the Rico Arena as well. So I had a lot of time to... Uh, to think of, you know, what was next for me and what we're going to do. And I developed this concept of, of building this Sports Turf Academy privately, actually. And um, anyway, it, was going to, it cost a hell of a lot of money to get off the ground. The return on investment was quite slow. So I parked it. Um, and then obviously the opportunity when we were going to build Seagrave came along and I was fortunate enough to be really heavily involved in, in that process from start to finish. And at that point, I, I approached Susan and, and the owners uh, at the time, uh, Kavishai at the time, and said, I'm going to sell you a piece of my soul here because it's it's quite a vocational project. It's quite a sort of heartfelt project. And, uh, yeah, for, you know, fast forward, you know, as we all know, you know, the club are very supportive of, of their employees and, and visions and dreams. And, and they unfortunately supported me. I Granted, it was a, it's a diluted version of what I had initially sort of mapped out in 2013, but Nevertheless, there's still a significant investment in me and in in our department and and also in our industry, and that's what it's here for, really. You know, we we are here to train and educate an extent generation of people like me, or just people, you know, the lads that work at the club under our banner, and bring that generation through, but also have an impact in the community and and the wider area, of Leicestershire, in the grassroots game, and try and professionalise what what these guys do, um, because you know, I, you know. Not many people know what we do, you know, generally across the across the country. Not many people will understand the amount of work that goes into producing pitches and and all this the associated areas and the science behind it. So that's you know that's the purpose of what we're doing. We're trying to be the world's best at it, but at the minute we're the world's first. So uh, <laughs> I guess you could say we are the best because we're the only ones that exist. So yeah, that's where we are, and that's a little bit of a sort of headline version of what we do at the Surf Academy. Uh, it must be a huge benefit to grassroots um, teams as well around the work you're doing. Um, I'll be honest, I've played on some dreadful grassroots pitches in my past. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of great at what you're doing. And as I've seen um, on your Twitter account, you've had quite a few visitors to the Turf Academy. So word seems to be getting out and then it seems to be going, seems to be growing quite well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the key factors for us is, you know, and obviously with the club as well, is, is the engagement with our local community and, you know, to date, we've been operational for that sort of pillar of the business plan because the business plan split into four pillars and this technical services pillar is is really important to us because it does engage with the community and does engage with grassroots football. Um, we've managed to improve just over 100 pitches across Leicestershire in 18 months. So we're really, really proud of that. And, you know, we're, we're offering these guys, which they're volunteers, you know, we're engaging with these volunteers and they're getting funded from the Football Foundation, um, which, again, is really important to the delivery of that that project. And uh, yeah, we're seeing a great upturn in the pitches that we're involved with and we want to keep growing that, we want to keep developing that. And for me, you know, if we can create great pitches around Leicestershire, that should create better football, which in turn should create more talent, which, you know, is all to do with participation from the government and all the rest of it. And yeah, I just think it's a nice thing to do. And I think arguably more Premier League clubs should feel an obligation to do it because, you know, the community and grassroots is an important part of the game at any level. And that's where the next Jamie Vardy could be hiding. And, you know, we want to make sure they've got the best possible pitches to play on. Granted, you know, 
disclaimer, they're not going to be like what we've got here because that's a significant investment. But they are, we are seeing a trend that those pitches that we're engaging with are definitely getting better. And that's a, an initiative ran by the Football Foundation, the Premier League uh, and the Grounds Management Association. And we're just effectively a contractor that's doing that work. But it, all of our work comes from a good place and, and from a, a desire to engage with the community. So, yeah, we're, we're hoping to grow. We're hoping to expand into more clubs across Leicestershire, hope that they all get more funding. And you know, there's, the government recently announced £155 million into grassroots grass pitches. Um, so any of the grassroots clubs that may listen to this or you know, I'd encourage them to get involved, speak to the county and get that funding through the door and then give us a call and we'll send some staff down to come and make your pitches a little bit better. So we're not going to cut and mark them out every week, but we'll certainly do some work that will make them better for the long term. Yeah, I think it's great what you're doing. Um, as you said, grassroots, it's where all the stars come from at that level. Um, if you can give them the best possible pitch to play on, then uh, I think it's great um, to see that kind of thing. Um, so looking at the King Power, um, obviously we're always going to talk about this great stadium. Um, over the summer, we saw lots of pictures of um, diggers digging up the old pitch. Um, and obviously we've now got a new pitch, which looks absolutely unbelievable. Kind of the design of that new pitch, what kind of things are in that new pitch that people are probably not aware of? So a lot of what you'll see on top is very similar. So we've still got the blue track, we've still got you know a nice pitch with plenty of grass on it. Um, and that's always the icing on the cake, really, in our job. But what the, the work that goes on underneath is probably the most sort of technical. Um, we've put sort of like a subsurface. We've, well, in layman's terms, we've created a big bathtub, really. So underneath the pitch, every drop of water that falls onto the pitch and infiltrates through um, is caught, captured, and then reclaimed. So down the west stand, Underneath the track where Brendan stands, there's a 100,000 litre tank which uh, attenuates all of the water that we, we put onto the pitch, be it through the sprinklers or be it through natural rainfall. That's then recycled and then the water that comes out is basically the water that we've caught. Um, and, you know, that, that sort of system is, is new. Um, it's, uh, it's innovative um, and it's important to us because we, we've got, when the we make these investments, we're looking at them not been done again for maybe 10 or 20 years. So we've got to try and future proof ourselves. So that's sort of basically what we've got under the pitch is if you can imagine a milk crate, you know where the milk bottles used to come in, chop that in half. And basically that is what sits underneath the pitch as a drainage layer. That's where all the water is caught. And then it goes into a massive chamber on the halfway line, um, on the track at the halfway line uh, on the east stand and then it's pumped around to the west stand into the tanks um, but connected to that we can also um, in a future date we're going to connect an air system so what this air system does is it basically forces air up into the root zone from the base upwards um, because what happens over time and the issues that we've seen around the pitch um, you know the back end before we could actually do this work was is that we had this sort of like panel this sort of hard layer at the bottom and that's because we can't get air down there because there's a big pipe wet network infrastructure that we can't spike through, basically. So this system allows us to push air through the bottom. And then if we're in a situation where, you know, in five years time that the pitch looks is suffering with waterlogging, be it a deluge of, you know, unprecedented rainfall, we can flip the switch and then pull all the moisture from the top into the chambers and then pump it out into the drains or back into our attenuation tank. So it makes everything a lot more efficient. Um, it future proofs us. It's one of them where, you know, in, in five years' time, if we're, let's say, hopefully in a Champions League quarter final, which, you know, the club would be set to lose a lot of money if the pitch was unplayable, um, we can flick a switch and, and sort of mitigate most circumstances. It also makes the heating more efficient because we can push that warm air through the surface up to the top and uh, and use less energy as we do that. So, yeah, so there's there's lots of science in the, in the base of the pitch. Obviously, most people, well, I... I understand most people know that the, the pitch is sort of 4% synthetic, the stitching in there, that which holds, basically holds the, the subsurface together um, and also gives the players a lot of stability if we do lose the grass cover. Um, and obviously you may have seen um, pre-match, we've got the retractable ball stop nets now. So that in the few, in the past, what we do is we'll put all the poles in, we'll take them out and then we'd wobble around with them and potentially drop them into the crowd, which we haven't, unfortunately. But um we've got this system now that just basically lifts itself out of the ground, pops it back in on a hydraulic ram and puts it away neatly in a big container at the back of the pitch. So 
that again was a first that was something that we designed and we worked with the developers on on producing and uh yeah so no doubt they were going to take that patent now and sell it across the world and we'll kick ourselves for not uh not protecting it but uh but yeah so i mean you know all in all it's as scientifically advanced as it possibly can be for this time we future proofed ourselves as much as we possibly can um and yeah we're really proud of it we're really really proud of it it was a great project delivered by the team um, and the local contractor and uh, yeah we're really really happy with it i am I, I love the retractable nets i sit at the front of sk1 um and i see them um and yeah it, it, it seems a lot easier that your guys get the nets down as b- before like you say when it was windy they'd be grappling with poles trying to get them down um so it, I- it, it's a health and safety issue as well you know and that, that's why we did it because um let's say for example we lift a pole out of the ground and then by some sort of accident or one of the players kicks the ball and it hits the pole, it is, it's going to end up in the crowd and that could be fatal. So, you know, thankfully we've removed that risk now. And, um, you know, that is always sort of conscious of the, those poles were always the thing that kept me up at night the most, I think, to be honest. Um, obviously match days, we water the pitch quite a lot. Um, what's the benefit of watering it so much? So, yeah, a lot of people will ask that question. Um, so it's a really good question is, you know, basically what we're looking at when we water the pitch on a match day, especially the, the bit that you guys will see when you're in the stadium, um, we do it for ball response. So as we all know, Brendan likes to play a quick passing, attacking, aggressive uh, style of football. Uh, and the pitch has a big sort of contribution towards that. So if you can imagine we left the grass long and dry, the ball would drag. So there's, there's a lot of friction on the ball. Um, so when we keep the pitch short, which we do, we mow the pitch at, at 21 millimetres um, and then we apply water and it is just what we call a zip. It's like a lick of water. It's very quick. And all you're looking to do is wet the leaf. So it's not to make the ground softer or firmer. It is literally just to improve that ball response so that the guys can, can get the ball around quicker and play the style of football that they they want, really. That's great. So it's kind of science all around, really, isn't it, to get to get the right, that perfect pitch. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, this, yeah, sorry, carry on. No. So I just think it's unbelievable. And I know that uh, match day, um, I, I presume you dread 12.30 kickoffs. Um, so what does the normal match day look like for you guys? Yeah, the 12.30 kickoffs seem to be becoming more commonplace all of a sudden. And uh, yeah, unfortunately for us, well, fortunately, unfortunately, it means that we're typically in at 4.30. Um, so we have to be clear of the pitch four hours prior to kickoff so that goal line technology can calibrate their, their cameras uh, the referees can do all their checks on their watches and their microphones and and all the rest of it. So, and obviously we have to be ready for. They do a test for broadcast as well about three hours before kickoff. Um, so we have to have everything in place. So th- the reason for the early start is because we like to make sure that we, you know, prep the pitch on the match day. So we'll we'll cut it twice, which is you know it roughly around about two and a half hours, and then it marking out, putting the goals up, um, any watering that needs to be done before the broadcasting starts pitch side. And um, that all has to be complete. So it's a, it's a busy, busy, busy morning. And then obviously they're long days because post-match we can be there for sort of four or five hours, um, depending on what we're doing and time of year. Um, so certainly in the winter, after the game, we'll big, bring the big lighting rigs in. And I you know some people that may follow me or may see it, say picture the stadium, you'll see the big lighting rigs we deploy. Um, because the expectation is summer all year round, unfortunately. So the days where we can not get away with, but where it's understandable that pitches go downhill in winter, you know, that it just isn't an excuse anymore for us. So yeah, so those days can be long. Um, it's, it's even longer when we don't win, <laughs> um, but you know, they feel even longer, but yeah, we've got a great dedicated team of people that, you know, all want the team, the, the first team to do well. And it's a, it's a pleasure to to prep, prep such a nice pitch in, in the stadium. So we're, you know, we're lucky, but it, they are long tiring days for sure. Yeah, and I think I've seen the lighting rigs. Are they the ones in the car park? At the back of the yeah. car park. Yes, I've seen yeah. them. Always um, up in the back of the car park, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's good that you've got the... Well, probably not good for you guys that are working long hours, but it's good that you've got the equipment to kind of get the right grass and, and get that pitch perfect every single time. So I think that's a credit to you guys and, and the work you put into it. Yeah, and I think also it's, it's a credit to the, the way the club have supported us. You know, we've... We've built this department from from not a lot of resource and not a lot of staff up to, to where it is today. And along that journey, we've been building the respect internally, externally for, for what we do and the awareness of what we do. Um, and yeah, you know, the, uh, you know, obviously the club have been so, so supportive of us and everything has to be justified. You know, as you, I'm sure you all understand, the club is really well run. 
Um, and financially, that's no different for us. We have to justify and authorise every single penny we spend. Um, and we've worked really, really hard as a department, um, myself and the team, to to build up that resource to make sure that my staff and my guys have got everything they need to do their job and create that environment where we can produce the best for the team because that's what we're here for. We're here to facilitate the players, facilitate all, all players across all ages and we want to give them the absolute best. Um, and fortunately, the club have backed us to, to produce that sort of standard. So, yeah, we're very, very fortunate, very, very lucky. Um, and I think when you see the pitch, it, it does look like one of the best in the Premier League. Um, you see some, some of the bigger clubs have got great pitches and, and then as it goes down the league, some of them are not so good. But our pitch just seems to be immaculate, no matter what the weather is. Um, and I know you guys had a hard time the other day when it was snowing, um, get the lines done and everything. Um, but it's a credit to your team and the way you all work together as a team to get things done. Um, one question I did want to ask, um, going back a few years now, we used to have some amazing designs on the pitch. Um, and fans always today even talk about how great them designs were. And then I think someone at the FA decided that we weren't allowed to do it anymore. Um, so kind of who does them designs, John? And kind of what's the process in getting them onto the pitch? Yeah, so, I mean, the designs, you know, we weren't the first in the world to ever put a pattern on a pitch. Uh, we won't be the last, obviously, as you, if you may have seen Wembley the day for the Women's FA Cup final. Um, you know, we we basically had an opportunity there where the club were doing really well. Um, the club were, you know, that was the year we won the Premier League. Um, and for us and for an industry, what we wanted to do was sort of make sure that there was a bit of awareness and we used the patterns to do that. And, you know, it worked because obviously you guys are still talking about it today. And like I said, everywhere I go, if I say I work at Leicester and I tell people what I do, um, the first thing they ask about is the pattern. So it really, really did land well, but there was a bigger sort of meaning behind why we did that. Um, but the patterns really was a, a case of consultation between the team. You know, we, we got our creative heads on, we'd, we'd map them out on paper, um, we'd design them, we'd measure them, and then we'd basically go out and just try and create it. It was um, a simpler process as that, really. It was, it was the creative minds of, of myself and the team um, looking at how we can, you know, do, try and do something different on a regular basis. And then, you know, again, fortunately, we had such a great platform that year to showcase what we could do and, you know, it wasn't an egotistical thing. It wasn't something to try and raise awareness of how good we are. Um, it was something that hopefully made people think, oh, I wouldn't mind seeing how that's done and maybe get into groundsmanship or, or in sports turf. So, uh, so yeah, I am. I will forever be, and I think it will be etched on my gravestone, I'll probably be the patterns guy forever. Um, but, yeah, we're really proud of it. We were really proud of it, and we were really disappointed when, obviously, the, the rules came in. Uh, but we understood why. They want to standardise things, a bit like FIFA and UEFA, where they stipulate the own patterns and um, we have to respect that you know there's not much we can do about it and uh, we enjoyed it while it lasted and who knows maybe in the future if they relax them or if there's a friendly we might get creative again who knows and so obviously the women are starting to play at the king power now as well it, does that kind of change your routine um, or is it the same for whatever match is being played on that surface so, so for me as a department um, and my vision within the club is to make sure it's consistent for everybody so there is no preferential treatment across the board whether you are uh, in the women's team in the men's team whether you are under nines whether you are first team you know we maintain pitches to the same standard throughout um, the schedule is, is probably the biggest issue we have in terms of trying to maintain that standard with a tight turnaround uh, obviously now that we've, we're in this Europa Conference League um, that fixture schedule has now just put four in a week at the stadium which is it's hectic, you know, it's busy, it's busy turnaround for us. And, but, you know, it, it, factually the women don't cause as much damage, which is, which is great. Um, but still, nevertheless, it is still damage um, that we have to cater for. So, but again, you know, what we do is we plan for these things. Um, I was heavily involved in, in getting the women to the stadium, um, you know, and I thought it was the right thing to do for the club, for us to make sure that we can showcase the women's game uh, in the venue like that. And, um, yeah, for us, it's a case of, yeah, it's more work, um, but it's the right thing to do. And uh, I think it makes a real statement and a real statement of intention for the club of how serious they're taking the, the women's team. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. Um, I think everything the club, club do is kind of the same for the women and the men. I think it's a great thing to see. Um, it doesn't always happen in, in clubs that that's the way it, ha it happens here. And I think it's great. So to let's touch on Seagrave. We had to at some point. Um, so Seagrave was designed years ago um when we saw the designs were like can this really be done 
and then it was done um, and it, people are just in awe every time they see it so kind of were you involved in the original design process of Seagrave and kind of how did that process work and kind of what input did you have? Yeah really really fortunate I think um, because the reputation that we've built up over the years internally at the club uh, with the senior senior managers at the club the directors and, and Susan our chief exec um, I was invited into that process from from day one and uh, I still am eternally grateful that was the case but I thought that I think they see the value in you know what we do here and, and the fact that we operate and cover 95% of this new footprint within my team um, they really seen the level of importance that we were involved from day one so yeah literally from from the early plans um, at a different site actually you know we, we, we potentially were looking at a different site in the first instance and making plans for that um, and then when we found Seagrave and uh, started developing that um, I came myself and my assistant actually came around for a bit of um, we'll call it market research. We played around the golf on the golf course just to try and get a feel for, for what we we're walking into. Um, and like I said, we we're really, really fortunate to be at the sort of the, the, the coal face of that. Um, I was part of the project board that basically was on the project. We met every, pretty much every two weeks uh, to run through and work with the consultants, work with the um, architects and the, then the contractors and then the consultants wrapped around the contractors. So, and then as soon as we started building it, you know, we were based here um, and yeah, it, it's a really proud achievement uh, personally and for the club um, of what, what we've achieved here in, in the space of time that we did. And, you know, it, we're still working on it now. We're still developing it now. And uh, but it is a sight to behold. And sometimes you can get lost in the fact that, you know, I've been here since the first digger rolled in. Um, and that was that will be for well, three years ago this year that the first diggers rolled in. Um, and I seen the vision sort of created on paper and then created in real. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been a, a, a genuine privilege and honour. And it was stressful and it was hard work and there was a lot of work that went into it. Um, but, you know, we're here now and uh, we're really, really proud of what we've achieved. And I think hopefully the, the fans and the, and the club, are, the wider club are proud of what we've done here. You know, it's, um, it's some achievement. Yeah, I think when we see the pictures, everyone's, everyone's kind of in awe. Um, how often do you play golf on that golf course? I think I think if I worked there, I'd probably be on it most days. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it is it is reserved for uh, first team players, first team coach and staff and directors currently um, because you know we wanted to keep it exclusive and, and bespoke and something that's nice for the players to have. So, you know, although I think I probably could play if I, if I wanted to, I haven't actually played it yet, and actually. Um, I used to be good at golf many years ago, but I'm absolutely terrible at it now. So I probably call, I can't go causing damage to the golf course that I'm trying to maintain. I don't think it'd be fair. Um, but yeah, we, listen, we've got a fantastic um, team of green keepers. We've got four green keepers that sit um, in my team and they've done an absolutely incredible job of turning the course around. I was actually out there today. I went for a walk around um, today and uh, yeah, it, for the time of year and for, for what we've what we've had to deal with, it's, um, yeah, it's special out there. It's really, really nice. Yeah, I think you're right. I think I've seen some of the pictures as well. Um, they look immaculate as well. Uh, and it's in kind of facilities that our, our club is a Premier League club. They're invaluable. And I think it also attracts new players to the club when you've got facilities like that, which are world-breaking facilities that any person that plays football would love to be part of. Um, I think it's going to be a huge attraction to future players as well. I think it has. I think, you know, part of the purpose of building it was to attract and retain talent. There's no, there's no doubt about it. You know, we... It, Beaver Drive served its purpose for many years and is still, was still, I believe, a fantastic site. But we were just bursting at the seams back there. You know, we, we were landlocked by the houses. There's no scope for development or growth. Um, so this was almost essential. But, yeah, certainly with that retention and that attraction piece, you know, I'd, if I, I put myself in the shoes, if I was a nine-year-old coming in here and or even a first-team player, you'd be hard-pressed to find any better facilities in Europe, for sure, to, to sort of do your business if you want to call it that um, and you know obviously retaining the players at that young age not that I'm sort of involved in the academy really but you know just from from a football perspective um, it's so important that we give those young people the great facilities that they deserve as well because hopefully we can then keep them and develop that talent and as you see with the young lads coming through now you know, you know Barnsley and Kieran Juicy Hall and all the rest of them coming through um, yeah, it's the, the future is of the club is potentially in, in those younger age groups. So keeping hold of them, giving them facility they deserve too is, is really important. 
Yeah, I mean, at a young age, and it's difficult for, for kids to make the right decision around academies and what academy to join. But when you see Leicester City, and, and this is what you can use and, 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 and your kind of career path to get to that first team, I think it's a huge drawing, even from that early age onwards. Yeah, it is. And, you know, like I say, for, for our little, our, our small part in that process is to produce the best possible pitches if you're an under nines player or if you are a first team. And that's why we offer that consistency. And it was, it was really important when we were setting the pitches out as part of the project that, you know, they're all constructed to exactly the same standard. It doesn't matter whether it's an under nines pitch or the first team pitch. They're all constructed exactly the same. The, the finish is slightly different because of, and that's not because any anything's worth any less or more. It's about the sort of the impact of those players on those surfaces. So where we stitch pitches for the first team, um, that's because they've probably got the heaviest load, mechanical load um, on the surface, whereas an under nine, they float across quite a lot. So we don't need to spend the mon- that sort of sheer amount of money stitching under nine pitches, but they still have uh, the same construction. So, yeah, consistency is really, really important across site as well. I think it's great what your team do. Um, and looking at Beaver Drive, um, I remember Beaver Drive of old. Um, how old are the pitches there? And kind of, do you need to do any extra work with them pitches because they're all a bit older than obviously the C grade ones? So, so yeah, I mean, but yeah, notwithstanding the fact that when I came in, we set out a five year pitch improvement plan um, that I had to present to the board um, in order for us to. We always had that, those Premier League ambitions back in 2014 when I joined and we were top of the championship, I believe, when I joined that year. Um, and then we achieved promotion. So we're always gearing up for the Premier League. So actually, the club have invested quite heavily in the pitches at, at Beaver Drive. Um, and some of them are in their sixth year now. I think some of them are in sixth year. And typically, they have a lifespan of about 10, 10 years, those pitches. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's not any more work because they, we've done the work. And, and the typical of this club and what I really love about working at this club is, is that they, they invest properly in the infrastructure. It is... You know, and they, they see the value in that. They see the value in getting things right properly first time um, from the ground up so that it is sustainable. And, and Beaver Drive is a case in point. You know, we spent a lot of money in the first three years that I was that I was there improving the, the facility, well, improving the pitches specifically to me, but also improving the facilities around the pitches. Um, and now that's standing the test of time with the women in there. You know, they've got those those great facilities to, to work, up, work with and, and we're maintaining them exactly the same. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, there's not any more work really. Arguably, there's more work in new pitches because they're they're new and they're they're sort of sterile if you want to call it that. So yeah, it's um, yeah the, the the infrastructure and the setup that we went through all those years ago is standing the test of time down there now. So and another project that we're really proud of of down there. So yeah, I think you're right, and also in WSL where the women play, it's like the best training facilities in the WSL. Um, so it's just unbelievable that, that the men have got that the men have got the best ones, the women have got the best ones. And I know the women won the championship last year and, and there was no games for like five or six weeks due to pitches being frozen, etc. Um, but our women were still training, whereas others weren't. And I think mm. that, that's a test of of how great the ground is, that they're they're able to use them pitches still, even when it's cold, when it's frozen, when it's water, when it's raining a lot. And it helps us win games. And I think it's just tremendous what you and your team are doing. Yeah, thank you. I think, you know, for us, the way that we see ourselves is we, we are a, a cog in a, a very big machine, but we hope that we're an important one, a valuable one uh, that contributes. There's so many contributing factors to to making football happen, you know, and, and pitches are a part of that. You know, we're not the, the, the start, middle and end, but we are part of that process. And we're really proud to be part of that process. And like I said, for us, um, it's important that we're here to facilitate players, whether it's first team men, first team women, whether it's the, uh, the girls' academy, whatever it might be. Um, so we always work to that standard. And like you said, we hope, we always talk about in our department, these marginal gains, these 1%. And I often refer to our department as the 1% club. You know, if we can make that 1% a difference, be it training through the winter, like you said, because of because we can get the pitches covered or we can make sure that you know they drain well because of all the infrastructure work we've done in the past um then that that's our role that's 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 what we do and we, we feel that we're an important role um but we are a cog in a very very large machine and but one we're very very proud to be part of yeah and i said i think it's great what your team um do uh, lastly i've got to ask this 
how many people when they find out what you do say can you come and fix my lawn um, <laughs> what, what, what do your lawns at home look like are they immaculate yeah. or do you spend too much time um using doing Leicester City pitches yeah I mean I think the thing is is that you know a lot of people say if I had a pound for every time I'd be a millionaire but if I had a penny for every time someone asked me that question I would be a millionaire <laughs> um it, yeah it's it, it's popular and, and I think the thing is is that most people are actually quite surprised when I, I have to strike a balance because I could go full geeky on you and sort of explain yeah. the, a lot of science and detail behind what we do um but sometimes I have to rein it in but depending on the level of interest that you know people engage with it and don't quite realize that it's even a full-time job people think oh it's a full-time job cutting grass all right okay um <laughs> so so yeah but you know it's it I have a lot of offers for people to come and, and do lawns and uh now I can just put them in touch with our you know technical services team that do these grassroots t- grassroots clubs and get the same treatment as we get here but uh yeah unfortunately and and you know I don't know whether it will come a shock or not to people but my lawn at home is artificial because I just don't have the time or the inclination <laughs> to go home and, and listen my role's changed massively I used to I used to be out probably walking 50,000 steps a day behind a mower or whatever um and over time my role has become so strategic and so centered around the organization of the department that you know I've, I've put on about three stones and so I talk, you know, sort of the roles changed and, um, you know, that, all the things that you see out there are a testament to, the, to my team, to from the from our apprentices who walk in the door last July uh, through to me. We're all as important as each other. There's no one person more important than the other. So, yeah, it's, um, you know, we, we do get a lot of questions about lawns, but uh, yeah, I, I never have the chance to do my own, let alone go and do anyone else's. So. Um, it's brilliant thanks for coming on John um, it's been great having you on really insightful I didn't think I realised how much science actually goes into the pitches um, to make them great as they are so it's a credit to your team um, it must be a difficult job making sure the pitches are perfect and, and also making sure that the science actually works um, yeah. and converting that data into meaningful projects like pitches etc so credit to your team but thanks for coming on um, it's been great having you on um, if you like this video uh, like it share, share it with all your friends Um, And we'll talk to you all next time. Thank you.